Reverend Dr. Kylo Middleton was one of the newest members on Charleston County Council to be sworn in in January. And so far, he's been tackling a lot of issues. I speak exclusively, Reverend Middleton, for this edition of Quentin's Close-Ups. And if you haven't already, subscribe to my YouTube channel and like Quentin's Close-Ups on Facebook. Reverend Dr. Kylo Middleton, welcome back to Quentin's Close-Ups. Good to be back. Oh, you're very welcome. I know your players, Phil, obviously being a pastor, a community leader, and now a Charleston <laughs> County Council member. Who else is Dr. Middleton these days? Well, Dr. Middleton is soon to be vacationing because uh, <laughs> after tomorrow, I'll be on vacation at least from church and uh, definitely, you know, still uh, very active in the community, still a community organizer, still a community activist, still uh, fighting for justice, especially in these times. It's still a, a very sensitive time uh, as it relates to our uh, social climate. And so trying to bring about healing, peace, restoration, and um, reconciliation in our community. And what else is the community looking for, Dr. Milligan? Well, the community is looking for leadership. And certainly there's always that vacuum where you're, where you're uh, you know, trying to figure out who actually, you know, leads, you know, people talk about the black community, whatever that means, uh, who are the leaders of the black community, who are individuals that are trusted and individuals who are mobilizing people for action. And we see a lot of that going on, uh, not, necessar not necessarily the usual suspects uh, as in years past, but the very new faces, very fresh, young uh, individuals who are, who are truly stepping up and taking us uh, in directions, I think, that are, that are necessary uh, in advancing uh, the, the cause of justice. And when looking at what the community needs, the community also needs um, justice and, and, and we need answers and we need uh, clarity and we need, uh, we need people to be upfront with us. We need uh, individuals uh, to, to simply uh, you know, be transparent and honest. And, and I think the community des deserves that. When you think of justice, and obviously you mentioned you know, the community leaders from the past and present, What's different from 20 years ago versus right now? Well, 20 years ago, you know, you probably would see the movements being led by pastors, ministers, clergy persons, uh, those type leaders and uh, civic leaders who have been identified, who had gone through, you know, a, a process of sitting at the feet of other civil rights leaders who then, you know, were anointed, you know, to carry the baton. And so that's not the case now. Now we have more grassroots uh uh, organizing. We have individuals who have just kind of, you know, woke up and decided, hey, I'm in. And, and, and they went. And it's good. We're glad. They're active. They're engaged. They're involved. Uh, they have their, 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 their fingers on the pulse of the issues of the day. And that's all you can ever ask uh, for individuals to do. Certainly, looking at um, the church's role, I continue to uh, grapple with that and struggle with that and, and lament over that because, again, the church does have a prophetic voice, especially the black church. And looking at all churches, really, I do feel ecumenically and interfaith um, as it relates to houses of worship as well as churches, uh, that the interfaith community uh, should be more vocal about some of these issues that we're experiencing today. And certainly, uh, it should be an opportunity to unite us uh, around humanity and, and issues that are most pressing toward humanity, because all of our faith traditions, you know, kind of lift up, uh, you know, treating your, your brothers and sisters and neighbors, you know, as you should treat yourself. There's some sort of golden rule component uh, in all of these faith traditions. And, and certainly I would think that uh, having a voice, you know, as it relates to some of these very public issues uh, would be helpful uh, hearing from, uh, you know, religious leaders. But, you know, that 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 is a an area that continues to uh, concern me. I hate to ask this, but has the black church failed the black community when it comes to social justice? Well, I would not say sweepingly the black church has failed the black community when it comes to social justice because some black churches are still trying to hold up that banner. Uh, my church, you know, being one of them. And so certainly when looking at the black church, you know, overarchingly, uh, we do have a lot of work to do and we, and we need to reclaim, you know, our voice. We need to reclaim our place and position. We need to reclaim our relevance. The black church certainly still has um, you know, a, 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 a lane, if, if, if you will, uh, for, for which 
to run in this country uh, as it relates to justice because no other church uh, as it relates to church uh, is speaking to these things. And so the black church uh, has that prophetic voice and certainly becomes the liberating uh, vehicle through which we can mobilize our communities, particularly the black community, people who uh, are uh, of color and, and those who are oppressed and marginalized, those who do not have voice and agency. The black church has been that. The black church has you know, been that incubator for organizing and, and for developing and, 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 and training uh, leaders, particularly in justice, in civil rights, and in uh, just the fight, you know, for equality, equity, uh, and fairness. So, you know, yeah, the church has to stand back up. And I don't know, uh, I'm only one black pastor, right, of one black church, and I'm a part of a denomination, truly. And so definitely, you know, we, we need to look internally within churches, uh, within, uh, you know, ministerial ranks to see where, you know, at some point, you know, the individual, just like I'm a pastor and I'm out, you know, in, in the community and engaged, I mean, what will it take? You know, we've gone through a pandemic now. So, you know, I don't know what other disruption do we need in order to recognize that we need to be outside of the walls of the, um, of the institutional church and be in the communities, you know, with the, fighting for the needs, of, of our people and trying to be those agents, those voices, those individuals uh, that will unify and, and bring about a more beloved community. You know, when I'm running around, obviously literally running, when I'm running a few miles a day or during the week, I'm always seeing, I pass by a lot of the notable churches here in Charleston. And I wanted to ask you this, when will the churches open back up? <laughs> yeah, so our bishop just uh, announced on, uh, Bishop Samuel Lawrence Green with the AME Church just announced on Sunday, on um, Pentecost Sunday, that the AME Churches in South Carolina will open on Father's Day, which will be June 20th. And so AME Churches will open officially on June 20th. And certainly I thought that it was wise, you know, not to rush uh, back and and some of our members even after that will still not have the confidence you know so we will you know remain uh, virtual uh, um, certain my church will certainly remain virtual because we're still under construction right and restoration renovation right. and expansion right. and so we will not be able to go back in and so we will remain virtual until you know our church is ready uh, for occupation. And I'm sitting right around the corner from your church, not even a block away. <laughs> but let me turn over back over to social, social justice. Let me talk to you about the obvious, because obviously Charleston County has been involved with it. And that is Jamal Sutherland. As you know, Charleston County has reached a settlement to obviously pay the family for what transpired with uh, Jamal Sutherland at the Charleston County Detention Center. Let me ask you this, Dr. Middleton. Why now versus four months ago when it comes to the settlement? Well, certainly my heart breaks, you know, for the Sutherland family and, and no amount of money could ever bring Jamal back. And, and we want justice for Jamal. We continue uh, to stand with the family. I stand with the family. Let me use the personal pronoun I. And I pray we as, as members of Charleston County feel the same way that we stand with the family uh, for justice uh, for Jamal. Nothing like what happened in the uh, Al Cannon Detention Center should ever happen to anyone else, uh, ever, ever. Black, white, green, purple, blue, it should never happen. And that should never have happened. And when you look at uh, why it took four months, whatever the case is, well, we didn't know. <laughs> I mean, I didn't, we did not know. It did not, it was not brought to the level of our attention uh, over the course of those months. We did not know. And when I say we did not know, we did not know. And, and for, uh, in many cases, individuals would then say to me, well, you should get it from the Post and Courier. Well, my goodness, I'm a member of council, so I right. think that at some point internally, right. uh, that information right. should be brought directly, particularly as it relates to matters this, uh, oh my God, I mean, I mean, it should have been the first order of business discussed or presented or, or at least uh, as a as something that should be in our inbox for concern and for uh, discussion and whatever. So I, I continue to say we need leadership across the board. We need sweeping reforms. And certainly uh, being on this 
aside, I, I had said earlier in this conversation that I am uh, a civil rights leader, a black uh, an act activist, uh, you know, for uh, rights and certainly for uh, black lives and and that sort of thing. And um, and and learning this, particularly, you know, Tuesday was the anniversary of what happened, uh, you know, to George Floyd and and having that verdict announced, not verdict, but having the settlement uh, announced even on that day was was completely the weight of that, you know, was 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 very um, sobering, you know, in, in the sense that, you know, in Charleston, we're also uh, dealing with something of this magnitude. And since, you know, again, it's still under investigation. I right. won't talk sure. uh, very specifically, but I, I'm telling you, I was outraged when I finally found out when, when it was brought to us officially, you know, as a matter of business, I was completely, totally outraged. I could, I remain uh, resolute that, you know, at some point we need to really look at our communication processes internally to make certain, you know, council persons, if we're the bosses, right, you know, at some point you need to inform your boss of matters that are of uh, grave uh, concern uh, to the entity, the government in this case. And, and I just really, truly think that we need to reframe our relationship as county council uh, with with those who are supposedly within county government, because I think at this point, uh, many, <laughs> you know, kind of use us as rubber stamps or have historically used us as such, and they have conditioned us in such ways that uh, that we just sort of just go with the flow. And at some point, we need to really demand uh, respect. Number one, and we need to demand individuals uh, to to really treat us like uh, you would treat your boss and or individuals that you report to and individuals who have oversight and individuals who, you know, who have, you know, legislative uh, powers as it relates to just, you know, the, the um, policy making and, the, and the, the forward movement of government. And I think that until we have that level of um, cooperation, at least, you know, and, and when you're from the outside and you come asking questions and, 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 and then you know, all of these smokes and mirrors, well, guess what? We're county council person, so we should ask questions and we dem we should receive answers. And sometimes uh, I, I, I've found over these last uh, five months uh, that that has become uh, an obvious issue uh, where those breakdowns have created systemic problems that even uh, in the face of what happened in this case, uh, made our processes that much more difficult. And so we need to be transparent, you know, even within ourselves, within county government itself. And, uh, and we need to be open uh, to receiving even criticism, you know, as it relates to processes, policies, procedures, practices, uh, those type things that happen internally as it relates to day-to-day -day operations, we should be open to receiving that uh, because, you know, every organization should strive for continuous improvement. When did you learn about this tape? Well, the tape, of course, I've heard, I heard about the tape, right? Well, finally, when we learned about what happened in the jail, uh, certainly, um, I learned that there was a tape and I was pushing day one, release the tape. I wanted to see the tape and then we didn't even, you know, see the tape. So we were not granted access to the tape. I'm like, what kind of crazy system is this that even the individuals who are clients, you know, are not privy to seeing the very tape whereby we are able to um, make decisions that would be pertinent, you know, very important decisions uh, that would be pertinent to healing this family or providing steps toward justice uh, for this family and to be, you know, fair with those who work within our employ, meaning those detention workers and those persons who may have been involved so that we could see specifically what happened and learn and understand, you know, what decisions, you know, potentially were made and, and at least, re, you know, react a little bit to, uh, you know, just what we saw. And, and we were not given that opportunity. I, I rejected it uh, when we were told that we could not see uh, the video itself, you know, for whatever reason that was given at the time. I did not agree with it. I thought that it was ludicrous, <laughs> you know, as an excuse uh, to give to individuals who are clients that would have to make decisions regarding uh, the matter itself. And then, you know, finally, I just... Uh, couldn't believe that no one else really also, 
you know, thought that we deserved to see that video. And, and so, you know, we didn't see it. So I saw it when it was released, right. you know, to the world is when I saw it. And I was completely, totally mortified by what I saw. You talk about obviously criticism and obviously taking responsibility in generalities. In this particular case, Dr. Middleton, have you been able to sit down and talk with the coroner, the solicitor, and even the sheriff? Yeah, so I, I have spoken with multiple ones of those people, if not all of them. I won't say which one right, you right, know, right. Ones in particular, but I've spoken, you know, I, I, I have done my due diligence as it relates to speaking to all of the parties involved, because I'm a council person, it right. is in my purview right. uh, to serve uh, my constituents, to include everybody in Charleston County, and to serve them well, and to be well informed. I think that it's our business. It is our business. I mean, we're not just regular people on the street. Uh, we deserve to know, uh, particularly based on the, you know, the egregious nature of, you know, the allegations and or, you know, the charges that potentially could be filed and pending other litigation that could come that also uh, will, you know, dawn the steps of our doors. So, yeah, I want to know. And I, I certainly did ask questions and I spoke directly to individuals, some of whom, you know, still gave me a lot of concerns after those conversations. But Dan, I, I know this is under investigation right now, but what else are you concerned about? What more do you want? Yeah, what do you I, want the I, public I, want? I want transparency. I want individuals to know, you know, from, from January 5th all the way up every decision that was made. I mean, you know, we, we were told that it, we couldn't know because the family, there was some kind of whatever the order or agreement with the family, the family saying they had no agreement. I don't know what to believe at this point. So I want to know, you know, I mean, a, a full report uh, from beginning to where we are currently right now as to every action, every Every uh, decision, every move that was made that potentially could have also, you know, provided, you know, some sort of, um, you know, collaterally, you know, you know, contributed, you know, to, to everything, the perfect storm of what happened. And so I want to know, and I want to know it from everybody, you know, all of the people, wherever the buck stops, that's who I want to know it from. Right. And so at some point, you know, we have to hold individuals accountable, um, you know, certainly elected officials, as well as individuals who work uh, within the organizational structure of, of the sheriff's department, the detention facility, uh, you know, the Palmetto Behavioral Health, uh, the North Charleston Police Department. Uh, certainly they have made conclusions to some extent threw us right under the bus. And so we need to be able to fully assess and know particularly policies, procedures, practices, best practices, as it relates to individuals who, you know, have mental health uh, concerns. And, and, and definitely, you know, when looking from, from the very onset, you know, of the call, you know, to the facility, um, meaning the behavioral health, uh, you know, I, I just couldn't understand, you know. So, again, it's a lot of questions. And I think that from uh, the arresting, uh, <laughs> you know, sort of question all the way through, uh, there are areas that still, you know, linger that that begs for us to know more. And I think that the the public deserves to know. We deserve to know, you know, as individuals who still remain on the hook, uh, ultimately. And um, and I do feel that people need to be transparent, and they need to tell us um, if you made a bad decision. You know, you just made a bad decision, whatever that may have been. I mean, everybody is not, no one's perfect, but we need to learn from these things so that we don't uh, have policies and practices in place that are, that are repeated and wrong and that could lead to death. Uh, as it relates to the detention center, now certainly I'm working on some things relative to that myself, re uh, recognizing that, you know, there needs to be sweeping reform. Of, of that whole structure, that, that entire, um, you know, how we have that set up. So uh, I'm doing some research on that, talking to individuals who are experts, you know, in that area to see, you know, particularly how I could, you know, roll out some, uh, at least some recommendations relative to the detention center itself. Now, who are those people on the hook that you still personally want to hear from? Well, all of them. You know, we have all of them. We have multiple 
entities that are still uh, involved in litigation. So I'm not going to talk right, about right, it, but right. I want to hear from all of them. And so, you know, you, you have to wait for the investi investigation to be concluded. The solicitor has already said that by the end of next month, maybe, you know, she'll be done. And so I'm not getting ahead of that, right? right? right. I'm not getting ahead of that. And, and I certainly don't want to uh, muddy the waters as it relates to that. You know, we've been advised as political people not to speak to anybody, whatever the case. And so, you know, that's ludicrous too. Elected officials were giving statements and other entities were releasing their videos ahead of other videos. And, and uh, you know, I mean, they put it squarely at the feet of Charleston County Council, right? And lots of people don't realize that the sheriff is really not under county council. The right. sheriff is an arm of the state. Right. But that was too convoluted to try to explain, you know, in, in the course of this particular uh, situation. So truly, you know, we have no true liability as it as it were uh but you know because of our budgetary and fiscal and fiduciary responsibility uh you know certainly we become the fallback as it relates to the budget and money but the sheriff is really under the state now okay you all and obviously this settlement is going to be break bro broken down actually between the county and north charleston and others how does the budget accommodate this settlement well, you will soon find that out. We had the first reading of the budget on Tuesday, and certainly we're going to have subsequent readings. And 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 on second reading, you'll see immediately you know, some some immediate changes to absorb, uh, you know, that settlement amount that was uh, announced. So I'm not going to get into that anymore. Sure. Right. Right. Uh, the finance and uh, our internal uh, systems are working on you know where those funds from where those funds will come and how to account for that in the 2022 budget because that was not in there right and so that has to now be um accounted for why couldn't this have been just a private settlement dr middleton a private settlement between the family and, and government and it, or without you know the pr stat as many people are saying i'm trying to understand your question why couldn't this have been a private settlement instead of just announcing it to the public and the media? Well, it was already a very public situation, right? Okay. And so I think that when the terms were reached, it was already private. Um, okay. you know, but, you know, again, people were still asking, and I think we need to be transparent. Uh, if you're peeling off $10 million of taxpayer money, I think the taxpayers have a right to know, uh, you know, that uh, you have paid out $10 million and why. And so certainly that why question uh, has to be um, answered by each council person why we voted uh, for, you know, that settlement in that amount. Um, definitely, uh, I'll give my why, but, you know, again, you know, right, I'm right, right. the the ship, the solicitor in her. Right. In but let me ask you a different way, uh, Reverend. Did this get so political and away from the actual legal facts? So for me, it never had anything to do with politics. I know that, you know, we're living in a time, you know, nationally, the climate is truly, you know, incendiary as it relates to police um, relations with people and police brutality. And we've had lots of national cases where individuals were paid out millions of dollars, uh, as they should have been based on those, um, based on those cases, you can't replace the life under any circumstance. And so, yeah, you know, we're, we're in a national climate where, you know, this is truly not where you want to be. And, you know, that, certainly uh, plays a role. And, and there were no national people, you know, kind of acting on behalf of the family in this case. I mean, you didn't have any of those big names, you know, that normally we would see uh, going from, uh, you know, case to case around the country. Uh, we've seen it nationally, those type lawyers uh, and or civil rights activists or, you know, those type people who normally uh, make it a more national profiled case. Um, we did have national, uh, you know, correspondence on the ground, I think, um, you know, the day or the days, you know, leading to uh, Tuesday and on Tuesday and even probably still this week. So, uh, yeah, th you know, for me, it was not political. For me, it was a human life. Right. Um, it was a black life. <laughs> and I, I just can't. Uh, 
continue to articulate we we really have to do some work as it relates to uh, relationships between the police and communities to include the black community, which seems to be disproportionately um, negatively impacted uh, as it relates to uh, violence and brutality uh, from law enforcement. I am for law enforcement. I have worked and I work with law enforcement, right? Some people don't, you know, respect my proximity to law enforcement based on the fact that I led the Illumination Project. I am for law enforcement. I cannot say that strongly enough. And I am also, I am also aware, you know, of the painful history uh, that that law enforcement has had with uh, communities of color. So. Uh, so we have to reconcile those things and we have to be involved in at the table of conversations with them in order to try to figure out, you know, how those reforms uh, can be put in place and how those can be achieved and possible you know, in a new and in a very innovative way that does not create the same broken system that leads to things like we've seen here in Charleston twice and now, and well, more than twice, but these two that we are talking about, well, this one, and then of course, Walter Scott, which is most noted, but more than that. Um, and so it's a painful conversation, but we need to, we need, we need reform in, in criminal justice. We need inform, reform in law enforcement. Uh, and, and we certainly need sweeping reforms within our, our systems of government that enable us uh, to oversee uh, these areas and it, without, you know, uh, you know smoke, smokes and mirrors and roadblocks and screens and, um, and, and kind of having you chase your tail, you know, so that you cannot get uh, true answers. I know, obviously, you're not an attorney and you don't want to get ahead of the investigation, but could, do you believe this settlement could taint the future jury pool? Well, we've seen that, you know, especially in the George Floyd uh, case, you know, we've seen nationally how such settlements in advance potentially, you know, because how can you say you didn't know, right? Uh, and, you know, these cases are so public and, and certainly anybody uh, who um, could potentially serve in a jury uh, in this area, if, if the case remains, you know, in this area, um, or in, if jurors come from this area, I mean, how can you say you didn't know? I mean, you would almost... Uh, have not watched TV or you, you, you would have had to evaded um, even social media and, and that sort of thing. So that is a concern. But, you know, again, prosecutors and, you know, defense attorneys alike, you know, there's a process for that as it relates to uh, polling or, you know, kind of assembling a jury. And so I would just yield, you know, to that system. Let me turn over to affordable housing because I was watching the meeting on Monday night online right over here, actually. And you said, listen, affordable housing is a revolving budget item. Let me ask you, how much do you want to tax the citizens to pay for others' housing? I don't want to tax the citizens anything. I don't, I don't think we need to raise taxes, period. I keep saying this and nobody's listening. We don't need to tax the citizens one dime. The county presides over nearly $600 million, right? Use that. <laughs> that is already, you know, we need to make different budget priority decisions. And so I'm not talking about taxing the citizens one dime. I'm talking about using that $600 million budget and re- um, prioritizing, and that's all you need to do, reprioritizing those things that are within the budget so that we are meeting the needs, uh, the, specifically the needs of affordable housing in, in Charleston County and, and in this region. And so it does not require raising taxes. Now, looking at the county budget, Dr. Billiton, is it harder to do a line by line audit at this time? No, it's not hard to do, you know, again, as we are presented the budget, I mean, the binder, you know, right. I go through it microscopically. And wow. so I just, you know, I'm a budget guy. And, and I just really feel that when you, when looking at those numbers, some people are intimidated by them. Some people are overwhelmed. I, I go through it page by page, you know, line item by line item, section by section, category by category, because there, there's a lot of fat in there, right? That can be trimmed. There, there's some waste in there too that can be uh, eliminated. And, 
and there are other priorities that, that make it in the budget, which I can't understand how we revolvingly fund some things that have nothing to do with the county's priorities, but they're based on other people's personal agendas. And so somehow we have to get those things out of the budget, and that would free up so much more money that can be used uh, for, for, for affordable housing. So yeah, yeah, there, there are ways to do it. Um, you know, certainly internally, our staff, they can do it, but it has to be directed. And so uh, until we get five people who are willing to direct, you know, a, a different sort of budget as it relates to our priorities, then we will, we will continue to receive uh, budgets that have been concocted by individuals with their own agendas that we just rubber stamp. Uh let me ask you this. Uh, what pet projects would you take out of the budget right now? I'm not going to talk about any of them. I've, I've been speaking of some of them, um, uh, you know, just until I can get a little bit more information. And because some of which, you know, these people are not even, they don't have 501c3s. Um, they have been, you know, revoked by the IRS. And how do we, over time, I mean, how do we keep doing that? And, and so then they're telling me, oh, we've checked the Secretary of State's all oh, I'm looking at the same thing. So are we looking at the same Secretary of State? Are we looking at the same IRS filings? Are we looking at the same tax exemption uh, records? And so I don't know, and I'm not fighting with these individuals, right. but I just really truly think that when we look at who is getting money, just take a look. <laughs> I mean, it doesn't take a genius. These things are public and, and the public needs uh, to be a lot more active and involved, making certain uh, that um, people's, you know, sort of <laughs> whatever, I don't know what, what kind of, you know, some of these organizations, you know, some are, are, are worthy. But at the same token, if, if, if your status has been revoked, then you should not be eligible. You wouldn't be eligible to receive money from the Coastal Community Foundation. You wouldn't be eligible to receive money from, from, from any grant. And so why on earth as the county are we without even vetting and or checking, you know, or verifying and requiring more of these individuals who've been receiving funds over the course of years to the tune of hundreds of thousands of dollars now, uh, some uh, approaching a million. And so how on earth do we not even require some, some sort of budget from them? Or, I mean, are we their budget? <laughs> you know, I mean, how are their, or how is their organization operating and, and what kind of fiscal practices do they have in place and why? Why on earth are we giving these people money without some sort of um, without some sort of you know requirement of them providing us you know even with progress as it relates to uh, why the money for why the money was given when when I you know brought a project to um, in Lincolnville you know right. we were uh, bringing up the parks right uh, so having the parks in Lincolnville one hundred and fifty thousand dollars oh they asked me all kind of questions and the people that. of Lincolnville well, you all bring us pictures back and make certain that the money I'm like how that. dare you and so yeah how dare you and, and then you have these other folk in the budget who don't even have 501c3s and and they are being given hundreds of thousands of dollars without any strings attached at all I just think that it's hypocrisy it is blatant uh, misuse and mismanagement, and we do need accountability. We do. And I think if we kick those things out of the budget, we would have more money available for anything else we wish to do. What type of resolution would you pass so that everybody can be fair when they're asking for money or whatnot? Well, you know, I don't know if there's a resolution to pass. I mean, just ask individuals. I thought we were going to have like a council retreat, and at that retreat, mm -hmm. we would then be able to kind of bring up some of our um, our constituent issues and or, you know, projects that may be uh, germane to certain mu municipalities and that sort of thing that could be helpful, you know, to sort of, uh, especially when they have budgetary impact. None of that was, you know, done. We were not even polled. You know, I was not polled. So I, you know, again, I was not polled. So let me talk about myself. Even as it relates to the ramp up to the budget, we have an administrator, right? And the administrator works for every county council person. I was never asked at not one time. Uh, you know, is there any particular whatever in the budget that we can put, we can begin to sort of craft, you know, some 
priority related to something that you're interested in. Well, I ran on affordable housing among, you know, one or two other things as predominant issues, right? All issues are uh, relevant, but definitely affordable housing is a crisis. And that is, that has been bipartisanly, um, you know, brought to the forefront by multiple organizations. And so, and I'm more conservative, I'm a conservative guy, right? And so when the Chamber of Commerce, the Metro Chamber of Commerce is supporting something like that, look here, I'm listening to them. And so so when we look at the nature of affordability and in the city of Charleston, of course, I'm on the housing commission for the city of Charleston as well. But, you know, when looking at the city of Charleston, you know, intentionally, you know, taking that issue on, you know, it can be done uh, in a broader way, even in the county, but it has to be intentional. And so all of these things must be done budgetarily. If it's not in the budget, and I've said it, the budget is a moral document. If it's not in the budget, you don't care about it. Now, I understand you, you also talk about the housing tax flow in, this, in that meeting on Monday. Let me ask you this. How are you reviewing and assessing a variety of housing policies, both short-term and long-term, for implementation? So we are reviewing <laughs> in more than a variety. We're reviewing a lot of housing policies, best practices that have worked. Uh, in other places, what the city of Charleston is doing, we, we have met, uh, again, across uh, constituent groups, you know, many of whom now make up the new, newly uh, re-energized or uh, reconstituted housing task force. Um, we don't lack, um, we don't lack uh, ideas and or uh, proposals or programs that can be put into action today. I mean, like right now. We just lack political will. And so I presented uh, a plan that is a four-tier plan, uh, also involving a revolving uh, housing trust uh, and, and three other additional programs that would be beneficial uh, to individuals who are currently living in houses and individuals who are trying uh, to attain affordable housing. And so uh, every council person has it. Our legal uh, department has it. And I'm just still waiting, just like everybody else. So, you know, we've authorized the hiring of a consultant. I guess we'll give that same plan to the consultant. I don't know. But um, I think at this point, we need political will. Now, well, how much are you guys willing to pay for this consultant? Well, look here, I don't know. I know we're asking for $10 million to roll out affordable housing. So, you know, any cent that we pay the consultant is, a, you know, is taking away from that $10 million. So, um, I, you know, I don't know what we're paying the consultant. I guess we'll find out, you know, the RFP uh, has right. been drafted or whatever the case is. And, you know, we'll keep kicking that can down the road until it, until it comes back. But, um, I just think that a lot of this stuff since 2014, that initial study that was done, right. and it's seven years later, and we've done marginally not enough, right, uh, to address the crisis that has already um, overtaken us. And so, you know, further studying something that we have studied, you know, it does not make a lot of sense to me. And let me ask you just one last time on the housing. What data trends and market demands associated with local and regional housing markets are you studying and analyzing? So we're looking at, you know, data trends relative to, you know, like, you know, these incentive programs, you know, that enable developers to, uh, you know, develop affordable housing at a, in a way that, you know, is a win-win for them and win-win, you know, for those who are buying those uh, properties. So, you know, there are light tech uh, sort of projects. There are other uh, kinds of uh, public private partnership type project. You have that low country, that low line, low right. country, low line. I mean, so we've been studying a whole lot of different, it's Spartanburg, they have uh, projects that we have looked at. And well, we, uh, me and a couple of other council persons who are interested in this kind of area is when I say we, I'm talking about me and one or two others uh, who are interested. And so um, I have to clarify that too, right? Because I'm not talking about an, um, an omniscient we, I'm talking about me and one or two other people okay. who are really into this. And we've been kind of delving into other projects and incentives and and um, and and programs, you know, that would truly work, right? Because we're looking for something that would work and something that would also, uh, you know, again help solve this crisis. So, um, so yeah, we have a number of them 
that are best practices that are proven. The city has adopted a couple of them, you know, looking at, you know, forming uh, uh, redevelopment and or, you know, sort of uh, trust, you know, that would, uh, you know, kind of be the conduit for some of these things, looking at the housing authority in a different way. And so there are a lot of different things that we're, you know, sort of doing, proposing and uh, cooking up, but, you know, it's too common. Now, have you performed a demographic and demand analysis and assess the gaps within the market? Yeah, so so we have seen, you know, specifically in our urban growth boundary areas, uh, we're looking at this low country rapid transit. You know, there's a lot of density that will be associated with that uh, low country rapid transit line. Certainly anything along that line should also be considered, uh, you know, for affordable housing, for building, uh, you know, projects to include businesses and commercial uh, entities. So, yeah, yeah. Um, Yes. So the answer to that is yes. Let me turn to 526. The uh, 526 extension analysis is moving along to more details coming out later this summer to update the environmental impact statement, more details on alternative routes and design options and cost estimates. The last cost estimate was done reportedly 78 years ago at 725 to $775 million. Given that time has gone by and significant cost increases these days, such as materials like steel and concrete, at what point does this cost just become too high for the county taxpayers to shoulder the burden of several hundred million dollars when there are so many other projects out there? Yeah, I've, I've heard a number close to a billion. You know, that, that scares me and that keeps me up at night, too. Um, I, my eyes are on 526. You know, that was one of the uh, issues for which I ran. Um, I, I'm very concerned about 526 completion. So I'm waiting for those uh, reports to come out this summer. Uh, the impact of the houses uh, that would have to be acquired. Some families have contacted me, you know, who would have to give up their homes based on imminent domain. There are a lot of issues um, that when you look at impact um, versus, um, you know, the, you know, yeah, yeah, there are a lot of issues to be considered. So, and to include the cost, um, you know, a billion dollars, that, that's a lot of money. Uh, we don't quite know how that will be funded. And so um, I support 526 and, and I'm waiting for more information uh, in order to move forward. A lot of my constituents don't support it. Uh, they call me all the time and they do not support the completion of 526. Um, I, I'm weighing it very, very heavily. Now, I know obviously you weren't on council back in 2012, but council back then in 2012 was going to stop the 526 extension. Uh, someone's calling me on the phone, but Bobby Harrell and Chip Limehouse passed council to proceed saying the county would have to pay back 11 or $12 million that has been spent so far on the project. About half of that on the right of way that could uh, so be sold to recoup the $6 million. Uh, and at the time, Current Charleston County Chairman Teddy Price said it would be it would bankrupt the county to have to pay back that money, maybe the other five or six million dollars that was not you know right of way, and yet the county found thirty three million dollars to buy out the old hospital deal and is now looking at hundreds of millions of dollars for this road. How does that work? It's ridiculous. <laughs> I mean, it doesn't work. It's ridiculous, and I've said I said this just on Tuesday night. We can't have it both ways. You can't say one thing in one context and do another thing in, a, in another context when it suits you. And I see a lot of that happening. Uh, certainly, you know, that's why you elect new people. And prayerfully, you know, those persons will bring a fresh perspective. And hopefully, you know, other county council persons who have just kind of gone along to get along will then wake up and, 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 and discover their own voice. And I've, I've been hearing, you know, individuals and clearly their own voice and some of whom saying, well, I've been saying this for, for 12 or 16 years and now they have some help because they have other folk who are also saying it. So um, it, it makes no sense. I've seen, you know, the Naval Hospital is one of the reasons that I ran. You talk about waste. I mean, just waste, blatant, total waste. Uh, that could be affordable, the affordable housing budget right there. And so, you know, there are always ways to, um, to, to, to sort of, uh, you know, criticize and or uh, critique, you know, things that have happened in the past. But, you know, the past definitely tends to repeat itself 
uh, if you keep on allowing the same people uh, the free course <laughs> to do whatever else you know they wish to do. So I'm pushing back on everything. Um, and, and certainly, you know, that's never, that's not necessarily welcomed. Uh, but, um, you know, I have three years and seven more months. And so I'm going to keep on doing exactly what I've been doing. What is your perspective on the half cent sales tax and 526? Right. So, you know, that project, that, that, that referendum, you know, was funded in order to, you know, do certain things, right? Okay. And, and I said this just on Tuesday night as it related even to other, you know, sales tax that, you know, we, we passed. We have to make certain that based on uh, the, you know, tenants of the referendum that we are spending those funds specifically on what we said we would spend them on. And, and I'm looking at things like that to make certain that those funds are not going, although they have already gone, but make certain that from this point moving forward, and if you listen to the tapes or read the minutes from Tuesday's meeting and, you know, third, you know meetings before Tuesday, um, you know, I am, I'm raising that issue, even the voice of one raising that issue uh, to make certain that when it comes back across our desk again, and I see that those funds are being diverted in ways in which, you know, to complete other projects that should not have been in the consideration because they were not a part of that, um, you know, referendum or those sales taxes, uh, I will continue uh, making that a case. case. Now, Dr. Milton, I, I, I know you've heard about this obviously earlier this year, and I know you haven't had a, a little time to really speak about it, but I'm pretty sure you've seen the video that uh, Councilman Griffin put out on your past. On my past? Yes, sir. Let me tell you something about Councilman Griffin. You know, C Councilman Griffin uh, is very immature, and we know him to be a racist, a white supremacist, and we know him to be a bigot. And so I would not spend two seconds talking about Councilman Griffin. But, you know, when you think about your past, you ran on strong moral leadership. Has your strong moral leadership been weakened by your lack of transparency about your past? So I don't know what you mean by lack of transparency about my past because I have nothing to hide. Now, obviously, you know, Mr. Griffin, you probably saw it. He put out, somebody put out some information about your past as far as your finances and, you know, your criminal records. Is that a lack of transparency in your mind? Should you have told, told the voters that? last year? So I don't have a criminal record. Um, so I don't know, you know, what that means. So, you know, again, I had, you know, a bad check, uh, in 1997, I paid restitution for that and moved on and never wrote another one cent. So I don't, I don't know what you mean by a criminal record. And I was, I'm not the first or last person who's written a bad check. Right. And so I, I, you know, it was not a situation that I wanted myself to be in, but, you know, I had a small child. My wife was not, Working at the time, based on health issues, she could not go back to, she couldn't work. And uh, and so it was a financially tough time for, for our household, right? And so that kind of went, and before I could take care of it, it had gone, you know, to the next level. So I, I did take care of it. But I would not consider that to be a criminal record. Okay. And so what el whatever else, you know, you're talking about, I don't know, because I've never been arrested for anything. Okay. Uh, beyond you know just that check you know check charge and you know a, a traffic violation now when he, when you you heard i'm pretty sure you saw that video what is your response that what to what he said about you so again um you know anybody can charge anybody with anything so i'm a public figure right right i've been a public figure my entire life yeah I've, I've been a pastor right uh you know, I've been a public figure my entire life. I've been an educator and right. I've been a principal, you know, right. uh, my entire life. So individuals, um, you're almost a sitting duck, right? You, you, you sit around and, and an individual on his or her own or her own can decide, hey, you know, I'm going to try to take you down. And, and if so, they can do whatever. You know, you can go to a magistrate court and say, well, oh, you know, Quentin, assaulted me. And, and then I have to go and prove that. Well, I did. I did. You know, there were allegations made that, you know, I kind of assaulted an individual. And, you know, again, the person never lived with me. So I don't even know how that lie started, except the fact that when he went and filed uh, the criminal, the, the simple assault 
uh, summons, which is a civil thing, yeah. uh, and well, a criminal thing, but you know, you, you just go to the magistrate. I don't know how it works in North Carolina. And, and he put my address on it, which was not his address. So that was proven in court and thrown out. And so I don't know why I'm even litigating this even further because a lie can only go but so far. Um, Councilman Griffin knew all of this information was completely thrown out even when he raised the question. It, 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 it begs to, uh, to ask, you know, what is the character of the individual? What, what is he trying to do, right? What is he trying to do? I mean, trying to discredit me over something that was a complete total lie. You know, I don't need to defend that. I don't find the need to go around, you know, raising that as an issue because it was never an issue for me. Uh, you know, it was something I had to deal with in, in the court system. And that's why I know that the criminal justice system needs to be reformed because I have been a victim of that. And, and certainly, you know, through my lawyers and through uh, just good uh, processes, uh, just following through with good processes, I was able to get uh, all get that thrown out because it was not true. In fact, on the day that the the assault supposed, supposedly occurred, I still had a church in South Carolina. I was right. actually at my church in South Carolina and my members testified to that fact. So what is Harry Griffin talking about? He is out of touch. He's out of step. And through that event, now let me do, let me tell you specifically what did sure. happen through that event. Yeah, so please tell your during, side. During, during, during that time in March, um, he jeopardized the, the, the life of my son and my own life. There were white supremacists calling us off the hook. Uh, we were threatened. Uh, we were, I had to move out of my house right here in Charleston. And so don't tell me anything about Harry Griffin. I'm a constituent in his district and he has, he has put my life in danger by his dangerous um, rhetoric. It, it, it makes no sense to me how an individual like that can even occupy a seat anywhere uh, that then um, makes laws and policies over the lives of other people. He is certainly not somebody that I support. I do not support him uh, because of the fact that he is a white supremacist. We saw that in his flirtation with the Proud Boys and his organization over the summer. We we see that uh, he's throwing out this, you know, whatever this thing, you know, that, that occurred with me trying to make it seem even kind of casting aspersions to sexuality and that sort of thing. You know, I, I have been a champion for all people. I mean, you know, LGBTQ, uh, heterosexual, all people. God loves us all. And so I have never made it an issue. Uh, and so for him to raise that to, to an extent, and certainly, you know, the, the young man, you know, who brought those charges up against me, uh, meaning the simple assault charge that did, went nowhere. I was never arrested for it. It was just a charge that, I, you know, was in magistrate court. Uh, and I have the documentation that it was thrown out. You can go to North Carolina public court uh, system and you can see that it was summarily dismissed. And so what are you talking about? Uh, you know, I, don't, I did not feel the need and still don't feel the need to address that with any more um, import than just to say that he is immature, he's dangerous, his, his, his words are reckless, they should have censured him even in city council and his conduct is deplorable. I cannot believe that he's representing anybody. Just wanted to get your side of the story on things, so I just wanted to well, get <laughs> I mean, I have nothing to hide, let me right. tell you, I have absolutely nothing to hide. Um, nothing, <laughs> nothing, absolutely nothing. Uh, and I still stand on my, my own moral integrity. Let me move away from that and just ask you, what's next? What do you want to do next on co uh, county council for this particular year? Right. So we're still working on affordable housing that, that remains next until we can get it, right? I thought by virtue of having the majority, you know, uh, based on just uh, party lines, uh, that we would have addressed that issue sooner than now. And certainly it, it, it has not uh, gone in the way that I thought we had discussed, you know, early in the year. Um, so that that's still next, right? Uh, looking at um, yeah, so so that 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 is the primary thing right now. I mean, we have several small things cooking, but but that that is the primary objective. You know, seeing what this process will be with this consultant, and uh, trying to figure out um, you know how we bring about using you know our own council rules and um, and and policies how we can begin to advance. Uh, some sort of movement on uh, some, uh, making council person take a position on affordable housing. 
Dr. Kylo Middleton, thank you so much for your time. And again, welcome back to Quentin's Close-Ups, and I hope to have you back on soon. Thank you very much. Thank you.